Welcome to Conversations. I'm Bill Crystal, and I'm very pleased to be joined today by Harvey Mansfield, Harvard government professor, frequent guest on Conversations. Uh, and we're going to discuss uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, whom we've discussed before, but I really wanted to, and very much worth watching that conversation, and of course, reading the, your translation of Democracy in America and the introduction to that, and other writings on Tocqueville. But I was so struck by a recent article of yours on Tocqueville's Machiavellianism, and then one or two subsequent articles, uh, that I thought very much worth discussing. Uh, so perhaps we can discuss Tocqueville's Machiavellianism and what I find in this article is a connection between Tocqueville and Machiavelli. It isn't just I, it's my late wife, Delba yes. Winthrop, who uh, left some uh, notes and, uh, in one of a, uh, a box of her writings. I found uh, uh, the beginnings or the outline of an article. So I finished it up and um, decided that uh, it was a joint product, and so we put it out uh, together. She was and more of a perfectionist than she, you, and therefore she wouldn't, wouldn't that's, that's was hesitant right. to publish it. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I have less hesitation in that way. That's right. <laughs> um, and I, so it finds a connection between Tocqueville and Machiavelli. Uh, you might say anything is possible, and if this is possible, that's the proof of the, po <laughs> of the proposition. But um, I, I, I do think that there, that there is a connection and uh, but you have to see it uh, in the esoteric message of Tocqueville, together with that of Machiavelli. You have to first convince yourself that philosophers wrote esoterically. Some philosophers, some of them, the greatest of them, wrote uh, partly for their own time, for normal people, for political people, for general consumption, but also for other philosophers. And they managed to do that in the same writing, so that part of it is uh, is is uh, for the general audience, as as publishers like to say, and uh, and the, and the other part is for is for philosophers. And if you want to convince yourself, you would have to read Arthur Melzer's book, Philosophy Between the Lines. That's I'll put in a plug for uh, for that book as a demonstration that uh, philosophers used to do this kind of double writing or writing with a double meaning. Um, now, uh, now, looking at Tocqueville and uh, Machiavelli, um, they were in uh, a similar situation. Uh, each of them lived in a time when uh, a general philosophy or religion or belief was uh, harmful, according to them. So Machiavelli lived in a time when he thought that people's uh, general thinking and philosophers' general um, uh, principles were too spiritual. People were uh, too interested in uh, imaginary truth. Imaginary truth, Machiavelli thought, gets you into trouble in this famous chapter 15 of The Prince. Uh, you come to ruin if you try to base your life on the way things ought to be as you would imagine them to be, uh, as opposed to the way things really are uh, and um, the way in which you really have to act, which is you have to anticipate the evil of someone else and get to him before he gets to you. So that was, uh, a, that's his general solution for a general problem. Now, Tocqueville, uh, also lived in a time when he thought that the general trend of philosophy and of thinking was harmful. But he thought it went in the, uh, in the other direction. He thought that uh, the philosophy of the early 19th, 19th century was uh, too materialistic. The dominant new uh, government, which is going to be uh, democracy, is very favorable to materialism and uh, easily corrupted by it. So, uh, and, and, and strangely enough, he thought that uh, this materialism had its origin in the philosophy of Machiavelli. Machiavelli seems like a pretty spirited fellow. He's uh, full of animus, as he called animo, um, and he's always, uh, and, he ha and he has a notion of virtue or virtu uh, that um, 
prompts people to take uh, daring and uh, bold actions in order to promote themselves, and he's in favor of that kind of virtue. But still, he led to a kind of materialism. When he, sa when he referred to um, the effectual truth of things in that same chapter 15 of The Prince, you must judge people not by what they say, but by what they do, or by what the effect of a thing is. Um, ju judge, Tocqueville judging Machiavelli by that standard, so that the effect of Machiavelli was to pr make people look at results uh, or effects, and those are always material results or effects, material consequences. So the um, result of Machiavelli's activism, you might say, is a certain pacifism. Passivism. Right. <laughs> yeah, uh, that um, uh, keep, keeps, keeps people from thinking that they can control their lives, but rather that uh, their lives are controlled for them by large and impersonal forces. And this is a general uh, belief characteristic of democratic ages. It doesn't like, dem democracies don't like to be believe in great figures or great men but they prefer to think that uh, we're all of us cowering under the force of powers that are too strong for us. And, uh, th the only thing that we can do is kind of surrender to the trend of things. Uh, now, uh, so then how did uh, Tocqueville indicate that uh, he had this belief about Machiavelli? Well, uh, he quotes Machiavelli just once in all of Democracy in America, and that's in a chapter 26 of the third part of the second volume, 26, uh, to an adept of Machiavelli, uh, the number 26 shines like a blinking red light, which cannot be ignored. Uh, 26 is Machiavelli's number. You can find this from Leo Strauss's book, Thoughts on Machiavelli, uh, a discussion, uh, a couple of pages on the number 26 and the way Machiavelli plays with 26 and multiples of 13 in uh, the uh, arrangements of his books and a number of chapters. So um, 20, 26 is Machiavelli's number. It's twice. 13, 13 stands for chance. Today, it stands for evil chance. Right. But Machiavelli sort of adopted it for himself because he wanted to control chance and to sort of erase it from uh, human consideration. Not quite, well, maybe not erase it, but at least control it, overcome it, and its influence on so his objection to imaginary republics or imaginary principles is that it leaves you open to chance if you believe in such things. You have to count on the chance that the other person will be nice to you. So, and, um, so, um, so uh, number 26, and this is the only reference to Machiavelli that cannot be by accident. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, that's the, that's the beginning of this, and uh, so um, and then you look at what he says about Machiavelli, and it's a quotation from the Prince in Chapter Four, uh, saying how difficult it is for um, a prince to subjugate his people. Now uh, we have to understand Prince a little bit better uh, in Machiavelli. Um, he uses the term prince. He's got, of course, that's the title of his uh, most famous book. Um, with, with 26 chapters. In 26 <laughs> chapters, yes. And uh, just that's right. Yeah. Um, he uses uh, uh, the, 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 the notion of prince to refer to ordinary political princes. But he says those ordinary political princes, princes usually operate in an atmosphere or a climate of opinion. And the trouble with uh, the prince in Machiavelli's time was the Christian climate of opinion, which um, makes things difficult for the prince. 
climate of opinion plus uh, the organization, the church, that uh, reflected the, the, the universalism of Christianity and, and which therefore gave the church the right and the practice of uh, interfering with the secular doings of princes. So in order to co combat this um, uh, chancy um, imposition, uh, Machiavelli extended the meaning of prince to include prophet. A prin prince can't be a, a full prince unless he can also rule over his, uh, this, uh, the opinion of the society in which he finds himself. So he has to become a prophet in order to change that. And so, and then, uh, how how should he be a prophet? What kind of prophet? Uh, for that, it turns out you need philosophy. From this, so from this chain of reasoning, you get to the meaning of prince as philosopher, in addition to the ordinary. So this is a kind of secret or hidden meaning of um, of prince, according to according to Machiavelli. And Tocqueville. Uh, fell in with this. Uh, he came in a democratic age that was afflicted by materialist principles. Pantheism, he refers to, uh, the, the view that uh, <coughs> the universe uh, it consists of uh, w one great principle that includes everything, including human beings. So human beings have no special place or just plain materialism, which uh, says that uh, uh, human beings have no soul, they have no free will, they have no uh, capacity to govern themselves. Tocqueville wants to teach us how to govern ourselves, and he takes us to America uh, because America has been a kind of success in self-government. So his interpretation of America is to show it to Europe, to the rest of the civilized world, as an example of, uh, of self-government and good government. So, um, it, 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 but it, a dem a democracy has these certain ills. And uh, the section of democracy in America in which the reference to Machiavelli occurs is uh, in part three of volume two. And in, in, in that part, is, uh, he's, is, he, he speaks of mores or mers, uh, um, the customs, habits uh, that uh, especially a democratic people have. And, uh, and, he d and, and, and democracy especially has to deal with uh, inequalities. It seems that nature hasn't just made us all equal as the Declaration of Independence says, but also there, that's true, but it's also true, the opposite is also true, that we're naturally unequal, and there seem to be certain natural inequalities. For example, those of the family. Your, your father and the parents seem to be unequal to the children. So how does democracy deal with this? And uh, so that's the kind of question that he takes up in this part three of democracy in America. And in general, his point is that uh, democracy is mild. It's mœurs uh, are douce, doux, sweet, um, so that the relationship between a democratic father and, and, his, uh, and his children is much more natural in the sense of sp spontaneously loving than in an aristocracy where the father is kind of harsh and severe and uh, authoritarian. But the trouble with the mildness of democracy is that it can lead to a mild despotism. So the mildness, this good thing, this advantage of democracy turns out to have um, a considerable uh, disadvantage. And mild despotism is produced or discussed in the last part of Democracy in America, and it seems to culminate his discussion of uh, democratic self-government. I think you point out in the essay that yeah, part three begins with a seeming praise for the mildness of democracy. Yes. And ends with the worrying specter of mild despotism. Exactly, so, exactly. Yeah. 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 
So, and part of the mildness is uh, uh, is is a uh, l lack of concern with honor or pride. And so this is this gradually becomes the subject of uh, part three, of, and he takes up uh, um, American women, for example. They're an ex uh, American women have a manly pride. Okay. So that's where we get our manliness from, you might say, from because the, the men are sort of occupied in business and making money, and uh, making money. Uh, you know, it, it's not uh, an occupation that uh, makes you f feel honorable. So, you know, in commerce, uh, everything has a price, and, and, uh, and honor is about the things that have no price, or that you stand up for, regardless. So, um, that honor turns out to be uh, connected to the military. The uh, Democracies are peace-loving, but nonetheless, they still need armies. And so, in the army, there's uh, um, uh, two kinds of uh, sort of officer. There's a commissioned officer, uh, and those people are mm, live a difficult life because there aren't aren't very many wars, <laughs> and <laughs> they come into their own when there's a war. But for the most part, uh, they're just sitting there thinking about uh, their, uh, what Machiavelli would call their ambitious idleness. Um, but they're in the non-commissioned officers, and those are the ones to watch out for. They uh, don't have a sort of career and a settled place, but they're ready to rise. Napoleon was a corporal, yeah. I, th I think Hitler was too. Yeah. So uh, that's that, that. And so I think uh, uh, Tocqueville conceives of himself as a non-commissioned officer. This is connected to another point in Machiavelli, where he says that uh, uh, towards in the part three of uh, Discourses on Livy, he uh, he discusses the kind of army that. Uh, his philosopher prince uh, runs and manages. It consists of captains. These will be philosophers who succeed Machiavelli and who develop and elaborate his doctrine uh, in in such a way as 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 uh, in in a way that he do does not do, because he he simply adumbrates the the kind of philosophy devoted to the effectual truth, but someone else will need to write the actual books of philosophy, people like Descartes and Hobbes. And, you know. So, uh, and he gives instructions to these captains of armies, as, as, uh, and, and, um, and at the end of, at the end, just to introduce this, at the end of, uh, part, of uh, part two of uh, Discourses on Livy, in um, Book Two, Chapter Thirty-Three, which is the last, he, there he speaks of uh, the way in which uh, a commissioned officer, um, when he comes to a strange and dangerous territory that nothing is known of, he will have to. Uh, he, he still uh, is under the authority of the Senate back in Rome. This is a Roman captain. Um, but uh, he'll have to improvise and uh, act for the best as he sees fit. So I think this is Machiavelli's way of indicating to the people that he's taking into mm. what we now call modernity that um, a, a captain will, the, these new captains will have to take general directions from Machiavelli, but uh, they, they won't, uh, uh, follow him out uh, r religiously or as, as if he were the sole or single authority. And, and Tocqueville, I think, conceives of himself as a non-commissioned officer who's rebellious in Machiavelli's army mm. <laughs> and wants to turn it around and take it in a different uh, direction. Uh, in uh, discussing the army, 
he begins to discuss revolution. Tocqueville does, uh, towards the end of uh, part three. And when he discusses revolution, he begins to discuss not just revolution uh, politically, but revolutions in ideas. And this is getting closer to clo and closer to both Machiavelli and uh, and who's his example of uh, the leader of a great revolution in ideas, Luther. Of course, he doesn't say Machiavelli. Mm -hmm. That would be uh, too dangerous. But he uh, Luther is, of course, an, a, 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 a great <laughs> prince, you could say, uh, a, a contemporary of Machiavelli, and who uh, changed the thinking of all of Europe uh, in the in the Reformation. So this uh, this this notion of uh, a, a single leader who creates a, a revolution in ideas um, is introduced, and that's, of course, just what Machiavelli was doing and uh, what I think uh, Tocqueville wanted to do as well. So he, f he imitates Machiavelli in just adumbrating this, just indicating that this is something to be done uh, in the introduction to democracy in America. Uh, he speaks of the need for a new political science, for the new world, but he never tells you what that is. Right. You have to gather it, collect it, put it together yourself. And so this is, I think, his, his way of showing you what the new political science will have to be now for democracy. It has sort of the opposite direction of Machiavelli's. Instead of looking at the, the effects of things and the way in which what is imaginary is uh, fearful and harmful and uh, misleading, uh, this will be, Tocqueville's will be uh, a, position, a position against materialism. And the most uh, important feature of this is uh, a soul. So Tocqueville calls himself, uh, in one of his letters, a new kind of liberal. And sort of perhaps the most important way in which he's a new kind of liberal is that he gives you liberalism with soul. In the introduction, again, he refers to the possibility or the actuality of, of degraded souls, not in America, but in Europe. And Europe doesn't know how to handle democracy. America does, so Europe needs America in this. And um, so souls, and souls can be degraded. See, this is, and, uh, and, uh, and the main teaching of materialism is, there, is then that you don't have a soul. A soul is what gives you uh, an opportunity to uh, reflect on what you've done. To, to, and therefore not to be a victim of large impersonal forces. If you can th think about it and uh, reflect on how they affect you. Or it, a soul also gives you the possibility for, of action on your own. So how can you have self-government if people aren't free to act on their own? And how can they be free to act on their own if they don't have a soul that gives them the power to initiate action. And so you're not determined by everything that's outside you. And so you're not a kind of automaton, but um, you, um, yeah, 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 you, you have the, the power to govern yourself. So this is a kind of new political science that uh, Tocqueville wants to use to replace the materialism that grew out of Machiavelli, and it comes from his, uh, uh, his engagement, you could say, with Machiavelli. Here he was at the age of uh, uh, 35, so 30, 35, right. when he was writing Democracy in America, but he had the, the perception, incredible perception, to s see this, to read Machiavelli with the with the um, you know, with, with the eye of a hawk, and and to conceive this way of uh, dealing with it, 
So this, is, this makes him and Machiavelli philosophers of the highest order and uh, sort of much more interesting and impressive and also a little awesome yeah. than the usual interpretations which uh, leave them as sort of political and moral essayists, essentially. Or sociologists, very shrewd sociologists. sociologists and yeah. Now, it does seem to me that, while there are, of course, many layers in Machiavelli, to say the least, and, um, there's a kind of directness in Machiavelli's project, though, the, the assault on otherworldliness and Christianity and imaginary republics, which I don't think doesn't seem to be the case so if to, in Tocqueville, that is, if Tocqueville is proposing a redirection of, in a, from Machiavelli's project, um, he doesn't confront Machiavelli directly, of course, or even that's right. Even modern materialism. I mean, yeah. he raises concerns about it. So why the? Am I right? He, is he is he there does, a greater yes. indirection in Tocqueville, and why? I why? think that's right. He doesn't. Uh, well, it, it's it's a. Uh, it's also the kind of indirection that you get in Machiavelli. That Machiavelli too doesn't discuss philosophers right. directly. He only discusses the consequences or the effects of philosophers. And I think Tocqueville does the same. And he doesn't uh, try to refute Hobbes and Locke and and uh, and so on. But although he he does discuss the philosophers of the uh, French Revolution right. in his other book, the ancient the, on the ancient regime. And I guess Machiavelli presents his thought, at least in one cool. of the two great books, as a commentary, as it were, on an ancient writer. And Tocqueville presents his thought as a commentary. Yeah, commentary on account, America. On America. On a, so there's the that way, yeah. similar. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Guess, yeah. And each of them sort of uses uh, the facts that he presents um, to do it. The, uh, the Tocqueville's indirection also shows itself in, uh, in this way. Uh, the, you say in Machiavelli the main enemy is the gentleman, the the person who uh, claims to be or claims to show a certain nobility of spirit, who is above uh, vile calculation and doesn't um, allow himself to be uh, uh, determined by the effects of his action, but takes a risk. You take a risk. You do the right thing, and and in doing so, you take a risk that uh, that that this won't bring you to ruin. So that kind of noble risk is just what Machiavelli tries to destroy. In in one of his chapters in the Discourses on Livy, he speaks of the German, the cities in Germany had this great advantage. They eliminated all the gentlemen. This was the and what a republic needs to, in order to survive is to eliminate the and gentlemen or the nobles. So and that's a touch of Machiavelli's ferocity, right. which you, you don't get in, in, in Tocqueville at all. So, um, b but then uh, Tocqueville doesn't directly defend the noble or the gentleman. In fact, he puts the noble or gentleman in this other form of government, the uh, the great alternative to democracy, which is aristocracy. And aristocracy, he, he definitely says, is obsolete. It doesn't uh, uh, conform to the democratic age, and uh, people don't believe in it anymore. It also came with uh, a certain oppressiveness. The common people were oppressed by the nobles. However, uh, elevated their own way of life and their own view of virtue, still um, the, the common fellow uh, had a rough time in aristocracy. Uh, and, and, uh, and so um, you could say Tocqueville cast, casts his lot with democracy. It's what, uh, and here he does believe in great forces, what the great force of providence is, uh, imposes on us is some kind of democracy. But we, we get a choice as to whether it's liberal or free democracy or slave servitude democracy. Still, one way or the other, it's democracy. So I think he tries rather, instead of promoting the gentlemen or the arist aristocrats, 
which is uh, not possible in his day. Uh, he tries to uh, democratize aristocracy and fit it into democracy. And one of the ways in which he does this is um, in, in his discussion in part three of the mores and so the women, American women, they're sort of aristocratic. Religion, which he makes a great point of in America, is a, a, a precious gift from uh, aristocracy. The idea of rights that we all believe in doesn't come from John Locke or Thomas Hobbes, the, the liberal philosophers of the state of nature who sort of democratized rights by saying everybody has an equal right. But it comes from uh, the history of uh, England, especially. Uh, the Things like the Magna Carta that we still celebrate. Uh, that, that was the nobles or the gentlemen standing up for liberty against the king. And he says that, that was the greatest part of uh, the greatest feature or virtue of, uh, of, of, uh, of the medieval monarchies in, uh, in France as well as in England. So there are all these uh, aristocratic features which are brought into democracy that Tocqueville wants to sustain. I suppose, I mean, Tocqueville presents himself, I think, more than Machiavelli as an observer or interpreter, not so much of a, you know, advisor to, to action, and, and submitting to providence and submitting to these forces beyond him, which is not really Machiavelli's style quite. Yet. But I suppose that's consistent with his intent, I mean, in a way that's, con that's consistent with his teaching or his intention, right? Is that right? I mean, that, that it's a, because precisely to what Tocqueville's trying to curb as a kind of yeah. Machiavellian uh, right, right, arrogance right. about so, uh, uh, overcoming yeah. fortune. I mean, but, yeah. yeah, Machiavelli wants you to overcome, but then uh, uh, you could say he's contradictory because what happens when you overcome, you are you become a victim of the very principle that you use to overcome, and that principle is necessity. Right. You must live according to to, the, the, to necessity, Machiavelli says, and that means you must do what the situation requires in order to save yourself, or promote yourself, or or survive as MP survival, sort of Dar Darwinian view of it. So you start off trying to make yourself free from Christianity and you end up making yourself the slave of, of material necessity. So that, I think that was Tocqueville's general. Uh, so, 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 so the appearance of free activity in, in Machiavelli is, is uh, delusive. It's, uh, it, isn't really a, it isn't really there. And there's a kind of surrender at the end of it, and so that and the work and of course Tocqueville worries about that in democracy that the mild despotism is a surrender to big government. It seems to be necessary. There's nothing you can do. So, Tocqueville himself seems to submit or surrender almost. In the, yes, he uh, does that. In order, though, perhaps, I mean it's the opposite, right? In a certain yes, way, he submits in order to in order to maintain democracy with honor. Yes, in order to and change honor or, and dignity, or, or yeah, some stoops to conquer or whatever. I mean, you know. that's right. At the end of uh, at the end of democracy in America, he speaks of the true friends of of hu of freedom and human greatness. True friends of freedom and human greatness. So freedom and greatness go together. You can't. This is again the aristocratic spirit. You can't defend liberty without a desire for for greatness. A theme very strong in uh, the Federalist, right. in uh, in America, right at the beginning of the Federalist, of course, to uh, America isn't America unless there's something uh, great about it. We get that on our in our politics, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in, and uh, and today is no exception. <laughs> right. Yeah. So uh, of course, greatness must be understood with honor and dignity, sort of true greatness, not just mere power or uh, mere winning. That's more of the Machiavellian view. Yeah. So uh, Tocqueville does submit, yes, he submits 
to the power of uh, of the democratic age, but uh, honorably and nobly because he still exercises his uh, ability and shows the rest of us how to do so. And in fact, he shows Americans that they already do so, um, namely uh, uh, with honor and a dignified manner that uh, pays attention to their capacity for freedom. We'll have to return in another conversation to the distinction between true greatness and fake greatness. But you can explain that uh, at some other point. But this has been a terrific conversation on Machiavelli and Tocqueville, and I think really bringing to light the true ambition of Tocqueville, which I don't believe has been seen until you and Delbo right. Winthrop saw it. So thank you so much for taking the time for this conversation, and thank you for joining us on Conversations.